enjoying your lunch. We have a little bit of a lunch program. Actually, one of my most favorite parts, because one of the things that people visiting the Kennedy School love so much about coming here is hearing from students, their experience. So all this talk about leadership and leadership development, we thought it would be a treat for you to hear of some of the students that are experiencing the Kennedy School, the leadership curriculum, the Center for Public Leadership. And I have the privilege to introduce to you the woman who's going to moderate this afternoon's program. Her name is Beth Desorts. She has been a dear friend of mine going back to our, our uh, partnership in the Clinton administration, uh, where she was such a huge support of the president, of President Clinton, and the work we are doing in the White House and around women's issues. But Beth has been part of the Center for Public Leadership since I came to the center, which is almost three years ago. She has been the vice chair of our advisory board. And I would say that, that of all our advisors, Beth has probably worked the closest with David Gergen and myself and Warren in really thinking about the outside people who should come to our center to be part of our family here. She keeps us uplifted. She gives us great feedback. She tells us the truth when we need to hear it. Um, she comes from a background of business. She's a very uh, established, incredible business owner in her own right. Um, and then she's been involved in democratic politics and is known in democratic politics as a, a force around raising money, getting candidates awareness, and mostly she's our dear friend, Beth Desorts. Well, I am very, very, very honored to uh, have the opportunity to introduce some of these folks for this lunch and to be at this meeting. I have spent some incredible times, a little closer, I have spent some incredible uh, time around um, the Center for Public Leadership and I want to share a little bit of that with you in a moment. But first, I want to say my, a couple of personal thoughts about Betsy. Um, I've watched Betsy grow. She was handed a huge opportunity with virtually no resources in the White House. And she certainly made a silk purse out of a sow's ear. She turned the women's office into an extremely important force and her voice was heard. Then she went back to Harvard, got a, got a further degree, and Harvard was smart enough to say, no, 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 you cannot leave. You have to come back and stay with us. And she had a series of jobs and ended up at the Center for Public Leadership with uh, David Gergen. She took this organization, got her arms around it, and found the heartbeat, and has made this place hum. And I think today is a perfect example one of the things I have said to Betsy is in, in creating this center, lead by example, let it be what we want leadership to be, creative, innovative, new thinking, inclusive, and that's what today is a perfect example of. The format that you came up with uh, for this morning's presentation, the inclusive nature, the ability for people to express their thoughts in a very open and unthreatening forum was nothing short of spectacular. So thank you, Betsy. I'm sure everybody shares. So now I just have to say a couple words about my, my most admired person. He is a giant, literally and figuratively. David Gergen. It is a privilege for me to say that I am in any way associated with that man. I am around him and constantly inspired by his judgment, his even-handedness, his ability to think clearly and without bias, his courage in standing up for his friends very publicly even when it's not popular to do so. And when I tell people some, you know, tell people I'm going up to Boston, I help a little bit um, up, up at Harvard, and they go, oh yeah, that's fine. And then I say, and I work a bit with David Gergen, and they go, whoa, that's <laughs> impressive. It gets people's attention. David, I thank you for your encouragement to me, and you always make me feel so included in such an important part of the center. I'm very grateful. <laughs> Warren. I heard about Warren Bennis, the giant 
the Warren Bennis. I was so nervous to meet him that I think the first three times I came here, I ran by his office quickly because I was so worried that I would end up meeting this, this incredible thinker. So one day he happened to be sitting there and Betsy said, you have to come and meet Warren, you must come in. My heart was pounding because I didn't know what I would say to this incredibly accomplished, thoughtful, brilliant man. We sat down, we had about 30 minutes together, and Warren, you did to me what I know you have done to every person in this room. You made me feel like I was the important one. I kept trying to ask you questions about yourself, and you gracefully turned it around and said, no, Beth, tell me about you. I was so overcome by your humility and the way you made me feel so comfortable in a setting that I was so uncomfortable in. That is one of your many, many gifts, so I thank you personally for your encouragement for me. Just, just another, uh, I wanted just to make another brief comment, if I could, about my, um, my incredible, uh, the, the, the gift that Betsy and David gave me in asking me to come and be involved in this center. I can only tell you that I was so struck by my experience in the first times that I started coming up here. I went home to Ron, my husband, and I said, do you think we could move to Boston and I could go work there full time? It is a center that is living and breathing. It is, it is taking on a life of its own, and I, I believe it is doing some of the most important work in the country. I think we have heard from so many people that we are in a crisis of leadership. We are all anxious and disappointed and disheartened by what's happening not only in our country but around the world. No specific, uh, no finger pointing, no party pointing, just in general, where are our leaders? If this center is successful and if you all stay with it and if collectively we can make this center the most important place for leadership in the country, then we have, will have done something most extraordinary. And I look at these beautiful, bright students that I am privileged to be able to spend time with. I reflect on my own education and I never went to a uh, an Ivy League school and I look around the campus and I see these young people walking the halls and walking around the campus and I think to myself, do they know what opportunity they are being presented with? And having met so many of them now, my answer is yes, I believe they do. They are filled with hope. The optimism is bursting from their eyes and it's up to all of us to give them what they need to go forth and really take on the mantle, take the leadership, and go forward and change things as we see them now and be our future leaders. So for all of you who have supported and who help, I am, I know I speak for the whole center when we say thank you so very much. Um, I have the good fortune of being able to present some very, very special people to you today. First is a glorious young woman named Shen Hayward. She's a research fellow at the Center for Public Leadership. Prior to this, Shen was at the University of Pennsylvania. She had been conducting research on training uh, the, she had been conducting research on optimism and resistance training for people with disabilities. She has committed and devoted her life to help improving the lives of other people with disabilities. When Shen was, when Betsy described you to me, she described you aptly. She said, you are a light. Your face and your smile and your optimism light the place up. You lead by example, Shen. You are already a leader. Your enthusiasm permeate the walls at the Center for Public Leadership. So please come join us and share your thoughts with us. Can you hear me? 
hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Um, as Beth was saying, I am now nearing the completion of a one-year intensive research fellowship at the Center for Public Leadership, focusing specifically on crisis leadership. That is, leadership during large-scale uh, emergencies that affect the public's health and safety. And this was a timely year to be, uh, to be working on the topic. When my fellowship is over in several months, I'll be uh, beginning my graduate studies in clinical psychology here at Harvard also, and hoping to carry many of the lessons that I learned at the CPL with me and to continue to form links between the field of psychology with the all-important field of leadership. After only 10 months of being at the CPL, I can say without hesitation that this has been the single most intellectually stimulating, productive, and rewarding year of my academic training thus far. Uh, specifically, at the uh, Center for Public Leadership, I work with um, in the leadership research lab of Professor Todd Patinsky and focus specifically on crisis leadership. It's a program uh, started by the CDC, Department of Defense and Homeland Security. It's a joint program. It's one of the subtopics under the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative, jointly run by the Kennedy School and the Harvard School of Public Health. In this research, we have been interviewing over 50 of the nation's top leaders who have a role to play during public health emergencies, for everybody from Giuliani to Julie Gerberding, the head of the CDC. And from that information, we're hoping to create two things. The first is a way to assess the leadership preparedness of, our, of the nation's current leaders. And the second uh, is we're hoping to be able to better train the nation's future leaders. Um, one thing that has particularly stood out to me at the CPL has been the seamless marriage between practice and scholarship. In many academic disciplines, there is a continual rift between those two ends of the spectrum. But at the CPL, under one roof, we have expert scholars on leadership like Barbara Kellerman and Todd Patinsky and Ronald Heifetz and people with expertise in leadership practice like David Gergen and Betsy Myers. Um, and their example of what a discipline can be when both sides are working together has certainly set an amazing example for me. And as I move on into my doctoral studies, I have become convinced that at Harvard in the various departments, we can gain all of the skills to become experts in our particular disciplines, but at the CPL, we gain the skills and abilities to change the world. Thank you. Our, our next student is Pablo Jenkins. He is from Costa Rica. We visit your beautiful country, and it is an extraordinary place. We're lucky to have you here. Pablo is uh, getting a joint degree from the Kennedy School, of, uh, from the Kennedy School and the Business School. Betsy told me that Pablo is one of the favorite students. He is filled with energy and optimism, and he told he told Betsy that the Center for Public Leadership is one of his best and most appreciated experiences at Harvard. So we uh, we love that he's has such a good experience here. Um, I saw an email that he wrote, so let me quote something in his own words about how he feels about the CPL. We shared the learning opportunities, wondered what about leadership could be taught, and gained renewed appreciation of how people experience themselves around us. Pablo, we want to share in your insights. Please join us. It's been a great privilege and really a joy to be part of this conversation. Uh, what Betsy and David had put together and the friends that Warren brought together and being here, it's, it's extraordinary. And I was 
thinking what to, to say when people here have sold 60 million books. So I'll just, <laughs> I'll just share how C CPL impacted me. Uh, the first event I came, it was an email uh, about a conversation with Warren Bennis. It's just uh, the Charles Hotel close by. And people ask that traditional questions, are leaders made or are they born? And I have to admit I forgot a lot of the details of the discussion. But I cannot forget how I felt in the presence of, of Warren, how I felt about myself. I felt very energized. I felt there was a lot to explore. And this may sound a little cheesy, but like I felt like I, I could reach the stars. Like something kind of weird to put in words, but, but actually it's, it's something, but I was like, that's kind of strange. Uh, you know, in Latin America, we don't want to admit we feel those things, so I just figured, uh, <laughs> let me figure out what, what I was feeling about myself. And I started to figure out I needed to explore more, and I just kept coming to workshops, kept attending the courses at CPL, and I found there's two things that CPL does that are extraordinary. One is always pushing the boundaries of what's possible with leadership. Everyone there knows that you either learn to fail or fail to learn, and they do it by example, with a lot of courage. Even people who've walked in very hallowed places put themselves on the line and inspire us. And they always work with partners. Had the opportunity to take two of Ron Heifetz's courses. And even someone like him, a master professor, the subject of books and leadership, put himself on the line, took risks, and knew that he only could teach with the help of his students and his TAs. Thank you very much for that example, Ron. The second thing that to me is very powerful is that CPL helped me and many other students connect better with ourselves, with their true selves. And uh, the quote that I heard today from Shakespeare just reminded me of another one that is very appropriate for that, and it's when Polonius talks to Laertes and says, These above all, to thine own self be true. And it must follow as the night, the day, that thou canst be false to anyone. And I learned from Ron and others that leadership is an activity, not a position, and a choice. I guess it can only be done from a position of authenticity and being genuine. Taking some of that, I was fortunate to pilot the first course that Shalom Sar taught called Know Thyself. Seemed like a good place to start, uh, Know Thy Team. Shalom came very generously, again to partner, after having coached some of the most important business leaders, and tried it out. It was the first time, it wasn't perfect. We developed a lot, and we had a great dinner at the end, and I realized he's also a great cook. <laughs> so we made a lot of friends along the way. Also, it's great to be able to thank Steve Belking, who, who has come and has again shown the courage and the generosity that everyone here at CPL has. And he funded 40 students to go and spend a week during their spring break to be part of the Hoffman Institute. We've heard a bit today of how important it is to connect to the heart. And to make something that's much less profound than Shakespeare, Paulo Coelho, which I, I don't want to, doesn't matter if you think it's profound or not, but to me, he says that if you stop listening to your heart, it stops talking to you. CPL and Steve are courageous to help people like us, try to listen more closely. In summary, I feel personally inspired and transformed by having been part of CPL. At a personal level, last year was a very difficult year for me and my family. But in the context of CPL, I saw even in a lot of personal hardship an opportunity 
to ask myself, what am I really made of? How am I going to handle this? And I discovered depths of compassion, reserves of patience that I did not know were inside of me in my much faster ascend to business success before coming here, um, for which I got admitted to Harvard. Professionally, CPL gave me, and I know it has given a lot of other students, the chance to do now a kind of service and exercise a kind of leadership that we thought would take us maybe five, 10, or 50 years to get to. I have just accepted a, a job with an organization called Endeavor. It identifies and supports high impact entrepreneurs that transform the economies of emerging markets. Jim Wolfenson, after leaving the World Bank, recently joined their board, and he said it better than I can. He said, without hope, there can't be peace. Endeavor is hope. To be used for a purpose that I recognize for myself as a worthy one is the true joy that David, Betsy, Warren, all the people who came together give me the opportunity to get to much faster. I'm confident that CPL is going to keep bringing people together the way it's done today on a subject that I feel is tremendously important, more today than ever. Um, and I'm just, mostly here just to be grateful. It's just, I could not imagine a very com better combination to, to my time at Harvard. And uh, I remain committed in front of all of you to stay involved and do everything I can <laughs> to keep pushing the boundary of leadership development here as an alum, as a supporter and serving the causes I find worthy. It's really hard to be succinct and express how much this place has meant to me and a lot of friends that are here. Lisa, the president of Kennedy School Government, how many times we've had discussions. Paul, another joint degree and great friend of mine, and Kirk, uh, as we've walked through this together, because it's always been partnerships, it's always been conversations going outside. Students of Ron, that 10 years later keep planting seeds in Latin America through coaching, through development. Um, but I, I hope that some of you who want to learn more, uh, feel free, feel free to, to find us, because I'd love to tell you more of what's exciting about here, and hopefully get some of you to get energized to be part of this, this adventure. And uh, enjoy, enjoy lunch. Thank you very much for having me. Well, now it is my great privilege to introduce Tom Peters. It, it's been an interesting few days since I learned that I was going to introduce you, uh, Tom, because I've asked lots of people about you, because how does one introduce somebody who needs no introduction? So I thought the best way would be to ask some of your friends and colleagues. <laughs> I'll only say the good things, I promise. Um, but I have surmised from all that I have heard and, and, and read that you are truly one of America's great leaders. Uh, the New Yorker says it best, in no small part, what American corporations have become is what Tom Peters has encouraged them to be. When asking some people about you and some of my own thoughts, you've written many, many books. Your book, In Search of Excellence, is considered the Bible. It is the book. It was the first book. It, it, in, it in inspired a generation, not the least of which is my husband. When I told Ron that I was going to be introducing Tom Peters, he said, oh my god, he's incredible. Beth, I remember everything he wrote. It helped me so much in my own business. He's the one who told me, walk around the offices, smell it, feel it, taste it, and his employees are so upset with you now because he's constantly in their office. No, that's not true. It is, it is, it is actually the lifeblood, I believe, of my husband's success that 
there are so many things that he learned from, from what you wrote, but that particular one that you have to touch and feel and smell what's happening in your organization to really understand and to lead. His, your friends also speak of your in, incredible energy, your creativity, your passion, and I, having shared some of this with you last night, will add to that, and that is your humility. Tom Peters, you are one of the most interesting and important thinkers of our time, and thank you for being here with us today. I really wouldn't have that difficult a time following to the podium my old roommate, Ken Blanchard, or Stephen, or maybe even Warren, but it's just not fair to put somebody after those two students. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I want to digress, which is all I ever do. Uh, I think it may have been March of 1978, and Bob Waterman and I were due to go over to uh, The Hague in Holland for the 4th of July to uh, speak to the leadership of Royal Dutch Shell, and uh, we had this notion in our mind that maybe there were some places that worked, which was a very unique idea in the United States at that time. We were getting beaten up by the Japanese. It was the first time that there had been cracks appearing in the American armament. And so among other places, one afternoon, we were both in the San Francisco office of McKinsey. One afternoon, we wandered down the road about 25 miles to this. It was a small company called Hewlett Packard. It really was. They hadn't hit the billion dollar mark in revenue at the time. And Bob and I were McKinsey guys, and we were used to working with Citicorp, and we were used to working with Chase Manhattan Bank, and we were on the 49th floor of the Bank of America building in San Francisco, and we were even used to occasionally being invited to the 51st floor of the Bank of America building. When you went to Citicorp or when you went to Chase or when you went to the Bank of America and you wanted to make an appointment, you made an appointment with the secretary to the secretary's secretary to see if you could have an appointment with the secretary, at which point you might get an appointment with the vice president, who was the assistant to the chairman. <laughs> at the time, there was a guy running Hewlett Packard, and his name was John Young. Bob and I didn't know him. And uh, Bob said, you're the junior guy, call him. <laughs> and so I called the Hewlett Packard switchboard down Palo Alto, and I said, can I speak to John Young? And I was all prepared to speak to the secretary, the secretary to the vice president, the secretary to the secretary, John Young. And his voice answers on the other end of the phone. He says, John Young, who's this? I said, well, I'm not really prepared for face-to-face -face <laughs> conversation. So Bob and I tootled down to Palo Alto. And I wish I had a longer period of time to talk to you, because I'd love to talk to you about the doors on the 51st floor office to the chairman of the Bank of America's office. And remember, this is before terrorism, so it wasn't like somebody was going to attack them other than their employees, perhaps. <laughs> uh, so Bob and I go down. We get ushered into Hewlett Packard. No badges, no nonsense like that. And we see this bullpen you know, come out of your local insurance agency. And in the bullpen, there's kind of a bullpen. It was about seven feet by seven feet. And there was this woman sitting in the bullpen and this guy who was in his shirt sleeves. And that was John Young's office. The, uh, the president had an office with a, with, a, with a wall that was about four feet tall. And he shared the office uh, with his secretary or executive assistant or whatever. And so we didn't think that this was possible. We assumed that you know, he was so important that it wasn't the real John Young. It was kind of like Winston Churchill who had a double, <laughs> or eight of them as the case may be. Uh, but it was the real John Young. And uh, a lot of things happened that day, but maybe the most important one, and it gets back to the introduction, is John told us about this term that they used at Hewlett Packard, which was called MBWA, or managing by wandering around. Uh, and there's no way that I can talk about that in 2006. I can only talk about it a little bit in the context of 1976 when you just didn't do that stuff. 
And we sat there, and I think we probably were two adults who sat with our mouth hanging open for a long period of time. Well, to make a long story very short, time passes. Waterman and I write In Search of Excellence. Book sells a couple of copies. We get to be on the Today Show, OK? So we got three minutes. And so Waterman and I are in a hotel room. Remember, he's senior to me. And I said, Bob, I'm doing a bit about the MBWA. You tell him about the business strategy stuff. And he said, oh, no. <laughs> well, we had a fight in that hotel room that night as to who got to say to Brian Gumbel the word or term MBWA. And so eventually we did the only thing he could do and flipped the coin. And, and actually, Bob won. And I'm surprised that anybody even knows my name today. Uh, <laughs> But the point being that, uh, you know, and I, this was not in my organized remarks, but, you know, as so few things are. Uh, but, you know, when I heard the comment on In Search, of, there was a period of time, I'm sure, Warren, you go through this, and Kenny goes through it, and so on, and that is, you know, you work like the Dickens for 30 years, and somebody says, oh, I remember that book you wrote in 1982. I said, would you know, I've been doing some stuff since then. <laughs> but with age. I have come to appreciate that uh, you know, it probably was the right thing for the right time. But it was a very ordinary book, and truly, and that's not said with any soft, any, any humility at all. You know, we were involved in McKinsey and everything was strategy this and strategy that and so on and so forth. And we ran into a bunch of companies, and they didn't talk about stuff, they just did it. It's like my old friend at Southwest Airlines, uh, Herb Kelleher, who once said, oh yeah, we have a strategic plan at Southwest, it's called doing things. And, you know, those are wonderful one-liners, but the reality is when they happen in a large organization, uh, it's pretty darn miraculous. And so Bob and I just wrote a book, and it was a book about people, and it was a book about customers, and everybody said, oh, my God, isn't that amazing? You know, years later, I was attacked by The Economist, and they said, Peters has made a ton of money walking around the world saying customers are important. How cheap is that? And I said, well, you don't remember, my dear friends, exactly how much grief Bob and I took from our 250 partners at McKinsey and Company back in 1982 because we said the customer is more important than the marketing plan. In fact, we only care we have a marketing plan. And then, of course, Ken came along and he invented the term raving fans, which I have subsequently stolen. It's absolutely fabulous, Kenny. Uh, we all do steal. Uh, so anyway, it's a very common sense. Well, it's the old line about plagiarism. Plagiarism is, of course, a reasonably hot topic here at Harvard these days. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say that. But what's the point? If you steal from everybody, it's called genius. And if you steal from one, it's called plagiarism. I've done a lot of both, so I understand that. Um, anyway, that was the deal. I, I, I've, you know, the other piece of it, and, and Warren is such a linguist, uh, I think there wasn't anything wrong with In Search of Excellence. But I really have developed a theory, and at least in my own mind, I think I'm pretty, I think there's some soundness to it. The magic of In Search of Excellence was all on the cover. He was using the word excellence and associating it with business. Because when you said business, you thought dry, drab, dreary, by the numbers, people, Warren had tried to dismantle this 30 years before, people as cogs in the wheel. And it's really a beautiful word. Now, I couldn't deal with it for 20 years because we became a hula hoop and frankly I thought if I hear the word excellence again I'm going to throw up. And it took me 20 years to get over it. And I came back to it recently. I actually, uh, I actually, you know, I needed to know what it meant so of course I did what everybody does these days. I googled it. Uh, the synonyms for excellence are that I found <clears throat> the primary ones purity, transcendence, virtue, elegance, and majesty. And my belief, it was true long before that, but my belief is that such terms, you know, you know, the, you know one of the happiest days of my life? I was so thrilled. You know every year they have that 100 best companies to work for in America? And usually it's like Genentech or SAS, the software company down in North Carolina, and they deserve it. And then two years ago, my fortune arrives, and I know this is a silly thing to say as, as a 61-year-old as, as I was then, but my hand shook. There is the 100 best companies to work for list, and there is the best company to work for in America is Wegmans. 
a Rochester-based grocery company, and I thought, now I've got it. Nobody can ever again say to me, oh, you can do that in the software world or the biotech world, but we're in the real world. Well, don't get no more real than groceries in Rochester. <laughs> and uh, you know, so the last defense was down. The antonym, incidentally, the antonym for, uh, for excellence is mediocrity. Uh, I was trained as an engineer, and unlike Warren, I don't know anything about words, and so I was in Greece last, two days ago, and I'm talking to my translator. See, I, I'm not an English major, and, and to me, antonym is like a really big word. <laughs> and so I'm talking to my translator, and I said, do you think you can deal with the word antonym? He said, it's Greek, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. We all have good days and bad days. I want to say one other thing, and I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but you know, everybody's saying all these nice things about Warren, and that's fine. I think a lot of him myself. But the, but the thing that everybody's missed is that amongst the people who are here today who've been mentioned, Bennis, Peters, Blanchard, and Covey, primarily we married way above ourselves. And that's essential for every single one of us, so I would say that. Uh, Warren, the one problem I have with these things, 75th and your 80th, is it's probably true of a lot of people, but I like to think of myself as a young Turk. And it, well, no, but it's not you. That's okay. It's when I see people like O'Toole and Lawler, you know, and I thought of these as young Turks like me, and now they're like, we're ancient and elderly. <laughs> And I'm having some real difficulties dealing with that, I want to I wanna tell you. Um, now, the real truth is, is I know that, I don't know whether it's true or not, but I may come across as re reasonably self-confident, but I'm not. Bill Russell, another Bostonian of past eras in his autobiography, talked about his 13 years in the NBA. And he said, the one thing I can tell you is I never played a game that was going to be a good game unless I threw up ahead of time. Well, the good news is I don't throw up, but the bad news is I'm terrified about giving speeches. I'm not that terrified about giving seven-hour speeches. I'm terrified as hell in front of a group like this, and that really is the truth. Somebody said to me earlier today, why'd you wear a suit and tie? I said, I dress better the more I get scared. <laughs> uh, well, incidentally, that is, for those of you who were readers of David McCullough's recent 1776, and if you weren't, you're idiots, uh, the ultimate dress for success story, which leads to all of us in this room, was George Washington in 1776. I mean, as Washington looked good on a horse. He had a very good horse. His uniforms were fabulous. The American army was sick, dead, dull, dreary, useless, and yet Washington dressed up when the Brits came to see him, and he thought, my God, these may be real people. And so, and it worked so well that, you know, he's, a, he's the ultimate Virginian. And, and, and came, I mean, he was in Cambridge, you know. This is where the Americans were and the Brits were over across the river. Uh, and, and people were, like, naming their children after him. Uh, that was on this list of things to talk about. Uh, <laughs> look, if you're trying to follow those students, you don't try to be the straight man. Uh, Warren, I want to tell you about something which I think you'll be perhaps amused by. Uh, I was hunting for Warren's Invented Life, a book that I wrote the foreword to, incidentally. Uh, I'll tell you one other story. Warren was kind, kind enough is the wrong word. I, I was in tears. Warren, Warren co-dedicated a, a, a book to me and Morgan McCall a couple of years, or a few years ago. And it was a co-highlight of my life, Warren, because the first one I ever had dedicated to me was by Alan Kennedy and Terry Deal, who wrote the Corporate Cultures book. It was not the seriousness of the book. It was the dedication that said to Tom Peters, Willie Nelson, and others of their ilk. <laughs> <laughs> and it don't get no better than that. Trust me. So Warren, I, you know, we are also students of coincidence. I'm hunting, I'm not one of those people who has orderly books, okay? So I'm hunting for an invented life. I want to tell you what was next to it. Next to it was one of my favorite books in the world, not known to most anybody. I tore the back cover off it because I didn't want to bring it here. 
And it's about World War II, and it was, it's a book called The War Between the Generals. And relative to our topics here, we think of World War II as not being like Vietnam, not being like Iraq. There were good guys, there were bad guys, and we were out to get the, the bad guys. And so we all pulled together. Let me read to you from the dust jacket. General George Patton on Omar Bradley, a man of great mediocrity. <laughs> general Omar Bradley on Sir Bernard Montgomery, a third-rate general who never did anything or won any battle that any other general could not have won as well or better. Sir Bernard Montgomery on General Dwight Eisenhower. If you want to end the war in any reasonable time, you'll have to remove Ike's hand from the control of the land battle. General Dwight Eisenhower, and I'm an old Navy man who grew up in Annapolis, speaking of the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Ernest King, one thing that might help win this war is to get somebody to shoot King. Sir Alan Brooke, the British Chief of Staff, Eisenhower, though supposed to be running the land battle, is on the golf links, entirely detached and taking practically no part in running the war. Now, the interesting thing about that is Eisenhower's remarks, if the unhelpful British attitude continues, then I shall go home. <laughs> now, this was called leadership togetherness on the, uh, on the eve of D-Day. So, that's the book on one side. Now, I think, I think there are statutes of limitations for uh, unheinous crimes. On the other side of Warren's book, don't you, he's a, or was, a, you still a Cornell trustee? Oh, Christ. Uh, I have only, I have, Meredith, okay, I have only stolen two books in my life. It's true. And next to An Invented Life was one of the two that I've stolen. Uh, I graduated from Cornell in 1965 and then again in 1966. And uh, the Navy paid my way through Cornell. And I paid the Navy back with four years, including two in Vietnam. So as I left, I knew that uh, the next thing I was going to do in a couple of months was go to Vietnam. And I did believe that being educated was not stupid. And so I was broke. I mean, real broke. Like, Broke having no money broke. That kind of broke. And so I went into the Cornell bookstore, and I found a book called The Battle of Dien Bien Phu and by a guy by the name of Jules Roy. And I thought, you got to read this thing. I just didn't have, was it 20 bucks? How much was it? Probably wasn't even 20 bucks. 6.95. <laughs> I didn't have 6.95. And I stole it, and I'm sorry, Ken. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I do want to turn half serious for a minute. Uh, and I'm going to read you a couple of small things from it. Here are uh, the chapter titles. This is a book written, I guess, in 63 or 64, something like that. The Birth of a Myth, The Trap, The Chamber Pot, and The Twilight of the Gods. It's an interesting set of chapter titles, is it not? It begins in the introduction. In July of 1963, nine years after the debacle of Dien Bien Phu, sorry, uh, Dennis Warner, an Australian journalist, told me how astounded he was to find the American generals in South Vietnam deluding themselves with the same false optimism the French generals had professed during the first war. So we move on then to the beginning of the chapter called The Birth of a Myth. A commander-in-chief cannot take as an excuse for his mistakes in warfare an order given by his sovereign or his minister when the person giving the order is absent from the field of operations and is imperfectly aware or wholly unaware of the latest state of affairs. It follows that any commander-in-chief who undertakes to carry out a plan which he considers defective is at fault. And the uh, writer of that was Napoleon. Um, so, you know, I went back and reread that book a couple of days ago, and that shook me up a little bit. So I said I stole two books, Warren. The Dien Bien Phu book, and you know what the other one was? The Leaning Ivory Tower. <laughs> now, this, I'll tell you, I, mean, I stole I thought it was such an incredible piece of anthropology. 
Now, I was getting my PhD from Stanford. In, this was 76 or 77. And at the time, George Schultz was the president of Bechtel, and he also ho held a professorship at the Stanford Business School. And I was working on my dissertation, and my advisor had an office next to Schultz's. And so I was working in George's office while he did Bechtel, okay? And I found this book. And I needed this book. <laughs> and so I have stolen two books, one from the Stanford Bookstore, and then I have the great distinction of having stolen a book off of George Schultz's shelf. So, uh, you know, there it is. Um, no, no. I love, I love you too much. The one, the one that I read while sitting on the John this morning was uh, the final chapter. What was the title of the final chapter? Didn't she have a page title of contents in this damn thing? Uh, the final chapter was what went wrong. <laughs> but it was a ma yeah, but the wonderful thing about it is, you know, the aspiration the aspiration was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so one other comment about a book, and then I want to say a little something else, and then I'll shut up. Uh, and it, when you think of missteps and good steps, and it's something I think it's terribly important to this discussion, and it sure as heck is important to everybody in this room, including our students. And that is, in the middle of all this stuff, never miss never forget what I call the missing 98%, which is good luck. I wrote a business book. Good business book sold 10,000 copies. It was a good business book, you know? It would have sold 10,000 copies. Waterman and I would have been thrilled out of our minds. And then the gods intervened, and every star was aligned. Reagan announced 10% unemployment, which meant business was an interesting topic. All my buddies, like, Athos and Pascal and Ochi wrote these books saying anybody with a brain is Japanese and no Americans have brains and people were sick and tired of that and so Bob and I said guess what we discovered a couple of brains anyway and uh, 50, 50 other things. A book that I have fallen in love with and I was trained by my mentor at Stanford was a guy who was the son of an Albany cop got his uh, undergraduate degree from SUNY Albany at the age of 17 and got his PhD in mathematical psychology from the University of Chicago at the age of 20 with a 30-page dissertation. Uh, there's some serious stuff going on between your ears when that happens. And I've fallen in love with statistics as a result of that. And this book is called Fooled by Randomness, The Hidden Role of Chance in Life and in the Markets. And I will read you just one quote. This book, which makes everybody mad, incidentally, this book is about luck disguised and perceived as non-luck, that is, skill, and more generally, randomness disguised and perceived as non-randomness. It manifests itself in the shape of the lucky fool defined as a person who benefited from a disproportionate share of luck but attributed his success to some other generally very precise reason. The best example they give, which I've heard before, is if you had a contest amongst all 300 million Americans on coin flipping, statistically speaking, somebody get 150 heads in a row. And after getting that 150 heads in a row, they'd get offered a book contract larger than Jack and Susie Welsh's. And they would write a book that was hundreds of pages long on how they managed to flip 150 <laughs> heads in a row. And the reality is 300 million people were flipping. As this guy says, look, he says, Warren Buffett's a fine guy, but if you've got 6 billion people in the world, one's going to be Warren Buffett. <laughs> and uh, so at any rate, um, now, I, you know, this guy says, and I believe this, and this is certainly true for all of us in this room, special as we are. He said, if you're very smart and you work very hard, the odds are incredibly high that you'll have a good career. But if the world goes berserk in support of you, then it's because the luck of God was on your side. And we should never forget that. You know, you think of the last election. Fundamentally, if 200,000 people had changed their vote in Ohio, Karl Rove would be an idiot, and whoever the hell was the Democratic campaign guy would be considered God. And the reality is it would have been because a couple of, you know, whatever. I'm not going to get into that. That's for, that's for sure, not in this crowd. Uh, 
At any rate, I want to tell you one thing because it has to do with what Warren has done for me. Uh, two weeks ago at this time, I was given a speech in Siberia. There's usually a response to that, like, what the hell were you doing in Siberia? Uh, that certainly was my question and Susan's. Uh, and it was a town called uh, Novosibirsk, which is a big industrial town in the middle of nowhere. And the reason it's such a big industrial town was it was like two inches beyond the bomber range of the Germans in World War II. And so Stal Stalin moved all the plants there. At any rate, if you give in speech in Siberia, you ask yourself, what the hell am I doing in Siberia? Uh, and despite my belief in randomness, despite my Hobbesian view of the world, despite my Darwinian view of the world, despite the psychotropics I take for my depression, uh, <laughs> that's important too, you know? I mean, if I, if I knew, despite the price of admission to Harvard, if I knew there was a course on knowing yourself, if I'd known that, it's a lot less expensive than what I pay my shrink, I will tell you that. <laughs> Yeah, well, David, it's, it, my shrink is in Washington. I'm his only non-cabinet officer, and you know, <laughs> it's. Uh, I mean, the other thing that happened on this deal was, so I got this god awful logistic mess, you know, that I'm when I'm going to Siberia because that's the name of the game, and it's just terrible. And so I called my speakers bureau. David and I share the same speakers bureau, the Washington Speakers Bureau. And I said, this is the most awful logistic situation in the world. You wouldn't have treated Colin Powell or Tommy Franks that way. And you know what the response was going to be, David. It was Harry I was talking to, and Harry says to me, they wouldn't have been stupid enough to go to Siberia. <laughs> oh, I deserved it, you know. I, just was, I did my own setup line. You can't complain. Anyway, look, this is the... This is the deadly serious point. It goes back to the in search of excellent stuff. I did have to ask myself, why did you go to Siberia? Why at 63 are you going to Siberia? And part of the answer is, I love what I do. And part of the answer is, it's a cool thing to go to Siberia because Blanchards don't go, the Peterses don't go, the Coveys don't go. And it was a big deal to them. And, 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 then, I, and then I thought, you know, well, what is it I do? And, and, I, and this, this is where it gets to Warren. I mean, I'd like to think that some of the things that I say about business strategy and so on are, are relatively intelligent, but it gets back to that word excellence. The thing that I really do is say business can be a place of creativity and energy and enthusiasm. I put a slide together afterwards and I said, the thing that I do is I believe in enthusiasm, motion, excellence, energy, excitement, service, growth, creativity, imagination, vitality, joy, surprise, independence, spirit, community, limitless human potential, diversity, profit, innovation, design, quality, entrepreneurship, and wow. And I know that's not the way business is every day. And yet I do believe that it's simply a human endeavor and the opportunity to do magnificent and magical things, if you believe it's possible, is literally infinite. And I think it's important that I say that because I'm a guy who's on drugs for depression. I believe in Hobbes. I believe in Darwin. I got a real jaundiced view of the world. But what, well, I do. I mean, it's, you know, you can't, you can't have read the history of humanity and be very damned optimistic. You know, I mean, that's, that's the real truth is of, the, of, of the matter. And so, you know, that's, that's uh, I would tell you the rest of the speech, but I seem to have lost my notes. Um, <laughs> because that's fundamentally, that's fundamentally it. I, I wanted to, to uh, say about two things. I, uh, I was, I, was I, not, I don't always go to Siberia. I was in Mauritius a while back given a speech for a uh, South African-based investment banking company. And we were there, and we were having this, this intellectual discussion. That's the way it is with investment bankers. Not intelligent, but intellectual. And, uh, 
And so we're talking about all this stuff, and I'm talking about Mike Porter believes this, Jim Collins believes that, and the Blue Waters, Open Water, Blue Ocean Strategy people believe this. And this guy says, is there anything you believe for sure? <laughs> and so I was going to London the next day, and I started writing stuff down while I was wandering around London. And I ended up with 209 things that I thought I'd share with you. Now, <laughs> And uh, there are some things that will help a little bit in the midst of all this. And like one of them said, don't ever forget to say thank you. Uh, there are an awful lot of people who are helping off every one of us in this room, given the nature of the people in this room, look real good every day. And saying thank you is one of the rarest things that a human being can do to another human being. Now, I live in Vermont these days. One of the other ones is I said, don't forget flowers. Yeah, because flowers can turn any place around, particularly during the nine-month winter that we have here in New England. And, uh, you know, there are a bunch of little human touches that uh, make all the difference because it's ultimately a human endeavor. Two other things that I have on this list. One of them, uh, and some of you know me, know that this has been a great passion of mine over the last 10 years. There are 500 chief executive officers of the Fortune 500, and eight of them are women. That's not a problem. It's stupid, it's disgusting, and it's a disgrace. I am not interested in the women's movement because I think it's a good thing for humanity. If it is, that's my private view. I'm interested in understanding where the world's markets are going. I'm interested in understanding where the world's legislatures are going. And the simple fact of the matter is that women bring an entirely different sensibility to the table than men do, and I don't understand why we don't get that. I don't understand at a trivial level why Procter & Gamble is considered to be a great consumer goods company, and of their top 46 officers, four are women. That's a disgrace. I'm not asking for 22. I'm saying let's go for eight. You know, something. So that's point number one. Uh, and the last point is, is uh, and I don't know how you do this here, and David, I don't know how you do this. Uh, there is a hell of a lot of good leadership around. It's just that not enough of us is, in, is it in Washington or Sacramento or Albany or Harrisburg. But the beauty of this country at some level is we don't depend on the capitals. You know, I was doing a TV show a few years ago, and we were, we were covering CNN. And Howard Baker's daughter, Sissy, was the national person for National Bureau at CNN, and I was doing an interview with her for television. And we were talking about what they do at CNN. She said, we had nine bureaus in Washington. And I said, why is that? She said, well, the important things that go on, go on in Washington. I said, excuse me? Now, I think Washington's important, and things that go on today distress the living dickens out of me, and other things make me happy, and so on and so forth. But the world isn't Washington. For 35 years, I lived in California. Last week, I went back to California. You go to California, you don't even know the hell there is a Washington, which I think is why the state's <laughs> done so well. No, it's true. No, I've always had the simple political view. I want either a Democrat in the White House and a Republican congressman, or a Republican in the White House and a Democratic congressman, because Washington is at its best when it is not doing anything. <laughs> and that is my political view in a nutshell. And my party allegiance is none of your business. Uh, but I'll tell you, tell you one final thing which is related to this, okay? Earlier this year, I went down to the world's worst hotel, the Opryland Hotel in Nashville. <laughs> It's really awful, isn't it? I mean, it's, you know, whatever. We won't go there. And I went down there, ladies and gentlemen of the Harvard community, to speak to the uh, Association of Tanning. <laughs> <laughs> you did it! Now, I laughed. And even though they were paying me, I laughed. And I said, you know, what the hell are you? I mean, I wouldn't be stuck in a tanning can if it was the last day on Earth. And so I'm chuckling about it a little bit, even though they're a client. And then I'm getting ready to go in to give my remarks. And I thought, oh my god, there are tens of millions of spineless bureaucrats in the public and private sector in this country. And this room is 5,000 people who had the nerve to risk it all to start a little tanning salon. 
You know, and I don't have any problem with the people who are in the middle management ranks, but I said, these are the most important people in the world. They had the guts. You know, they were 29, they were 32, they were 36, whatever they were. Their net worth was probably all of $82,311, and they'd gotten together with somebody else who had a net worth of $82,311 and bet the whole table on doing a good tanning salon, and that's cool. So as we talk about this center, let's also not forget that the real base of leadership in this co country, as it has always been, are those unnamed tens of thousands of people who have the nerve to put it on the line every day. Uh, I just love Warren to death, and all I can tell you in, 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 in final line is um, I'm only 63, but when I grow up, I want to be Warren Bennis. Thank you very much. <laughs>